Welcome to the online module, Students' Risks for Out-of-School Suspensions, Indigenous Heritage, and Child Welfare System Involvement. This module presents the results of a quantitative analysis of statewide data from the Minnesota Linking Information for Kids, or MinLink, project. My name is Shelby Flanagan, and I'm a research assistant and PhD student at the University of Minnesota. Our project team at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work includes Mene Cho, Assistant Professor at the University of Memphis, Yang Ji Yoon, Assistant Professor at Colorado State University Pueblo, and Wendy Haight, Professor in Gamble Scogmo Chair. We are grateful for the financial support of the Gamble Scogmo Endowment and the federal title 4E funding through the Minnesota Department of Human Services and the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare. This module has four parts. First, we will provide an overview of risk factors of out-of-school suspension. Second, we will discuss our research methods. Third, we will discuss the findings of this study. And finally, we will discuss the implications for practice and policy. This module has three learning objectives. You will learn why it is important to understand the risk factors that lead to students being suspended out of school, as well as the relationships between students having indigenous heritage, being involved in the child welfare system, and out-of-school suspension. And we also hope you will be able to reflect on the applications this information may have for your practice, especially in terms of efforts to reduce disproportionality in school discipline and find alternative solutions to student misbehavior. Let's start with background about risk factors of out-of-school suspension. Out-of-school suspension, or OSS, is a widely used disciplinary practice in which a student is removed from school for a period of no more than 10 days. Among 50 million students enrolled in U.S. public schools during the 2015 to 2016 school year, about 3.1% and 1.9% experienced single and multiple out-of-school suspensions, respectively. Out-of-school suspensions are not effective and even harmful. They are positively associated with students' future misbehaviors, school dropout, and negatively associated with physical and emotional health. OSS is also associated with entry into the juvenile justice system, known as the school to prison pipeline. Here's what we know from the existing literature. Maltreated adolescents are suspended more than twice as often as those who had not been maltreated. It is also notable that indigenous children have a lower prevalence of child maltreatment compared to most other groups. Despite this, indigenous children are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. The high rates of removal of Indigenous children in North American public child welfare systems is one of the most pressing and controversial issues facing sovereign tribal nations, tribal communities, Native families, and child welfare policymakers and practitioners today. Briefly, there is ample evidence that Indigenous families are treated differently within child welfare systems and have more adverse outcomes at all levels of system involvement than families from other groups. Furthermore, high rates of removal persist more than 40 years after the passage of the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA. ICWA was passed in 1978 at the demand of tribes to halt the removal of children by the child welfare system. Forced indigenous child removal has been a long practice of the U.S. government, most notably during the boarding school era that began in the late 1800s and the Indian Adoption Project in the 1960s. ICWA also focuses on reclaiming and preserving indigenous cultures. It recognizes that the removal of indigenous children from their families is devastating not only for those families, but for indigenous communities as a whole. Given the overrepresentation of indigenous children in OSS and the child welfare system, and the expected relationship between OSS and child welfare system involvement, it's important to better understand the relationships between all of these factors. Yet few studies have investigated the relationship among indigeneity, child welfare, and OSS experiences. In particular, examining the moderating effect of indigeneity and child welfare involvement on OSS experience across a state where multiple federally recognized indigenous tribal governments exist will be beneficial to provide deeper understanding of risk factors of OSS. Let's discuss our research methods. This study aimed to determine what factors affect out-of-school suspension experiences. The two research questions are as follows. First, are ethnicity or indigeneity and child maltreatment allegations individually related to OSS? Second, is there a moderating effect of ethnicity or indigeneity on the relationship between child maltreatment allegations and out-of-school suspension? In order to investigate risk factors of OSS, the study used a longitudinal survey design. We also used a secondary data set from the Minnesota Linking Information for Kids project. 
This project has a statewide administrative data, including the Minnesota Automated Reporting Student System and the Disciplinary Incident Reporting System from the Department of Education, the Social Service Information System from the Department of Human Services, and School Information from the Department of Education. The sample was 60,000 and 25 third graders enrolled in Minnesota public schools in the academic year of 2008 to 2009. For the analysis, descriptive analyses were used to describe the socioeconomic characteristics of the sample. For the main analysis, we conducted zero inflated negative binomial regression to investigate factors that affect OSS experience and examine the moderating effect of ethnicity or indigeneity on the relationship between child maltreatment allegations and OSS experiences. Let's move on to the findings. This table shows the sociodemographic characteristics of the sample by ethnicity. You can see that compared to white students, more indigenous students qualified for free and reduced lunch, indicating lower family socioeconomic status, were receiving special education and were identified as having emotional or behavioral disabilities. You can also see that compared to white students, indigenous students tended to have lower reading and math scores and limited English proficiency. Finally, compared to white students, indigenous students were more likely to have previous involvement in the child welfare system and 10 times more likely to have experienced out of home care. Also, the mean number of OSS that indigenous students experienced was four times that of white students. This table shows the analysis results regarding research question one, are ethnicity and indigeneity and child maltreatment allegations individually related to OSS? Black students experienced OSS 58.9% more frequently. Indigenous students experienced OSS 79% more frequently compared to white students, whereas Asian students were less likely to experience OSS than white students. For each additional child maltreatment report, a child experienced a 17.4% increase in OSS. Research question two was, is there a moderating effect of ethnicity or indigeneity on the relationship between child maltreatment allegations and OSS? So we included the interaction effect of ethnicity or indigeneity and child maltreatment allegations on OSS. The interaction of being indigenous and allegations of maltreatment was significant, but this interaction was not significant for any other BIPOC groups. After including the interaction term of ethnicity or indigeneity and child maltreatment, the effect of being indigenous and child maltreatment on OSS experiences remained significant. Students with more child maltreatment reports experienced more frequent OSS and indigenous students were suspended out of school more than twice as often as white students. This graph shows the interaction effect of being indigenous and maltreatment allegations on the number of OSS experiences. The relationship between maltreatment reports and number of out-of-school suspensions is stronger for white students than for indigenous students. At lower numbers of child maltreatment reports, indigenous students experienced higher risk of OSS than white students, but at higher numbers of reports, the risk of OSS becomes the same for white and indigenous students. Let's consider the implications of these findings. The moderating effect of indigeneity on the relationship between child maltreatment allegations and OSS experiences supports the idea that indigenous communities are impacted in a specific way by the child welfare system due to the historical and ongoing colonial aspects of this system that continue to target indigenous families and remove children at disproportionate rates. OSS compounds these risk factors, adding additional burdens to indigenous children. Indigenous children may experience relatively high levels of both child maltreatment allegations and OSS, not because indigenous families are more likely to maltreat their children or that indigenous children are more likely to misbehave at school, but due to systemic racism within the US settler colonial state. Professionals in child welfare and education systems should form relationships with tribal leaders to address how to reduce systemic barriers for indigenous children's school success, including disproportionate involvement in OSS. These study results also have implications for school discipline. The interaction of indigeneity and child maltreatment allegations on school discipline outcomes indicates that some of the well-documented disproportionality in school discipline could be resolved through strong partnerships between child welfare, school systems, and indigenous communities to improve outcomes for children and families involved in both systems. Additionally, given the relationship between child welfare involvement and discipline outcomes like OSS, which can be followed by juvenile justice system involvement in the long term. This points to a need for restructuring discipline in education and moving away from exclusionary discipline like OSS. 
This study has several limitations. First, the study estimated the model as a single level model, but future studies replicating this study would benefit from multi-level modeling as it would provide more robust information considering the nested data structure. Second, given that the study uses longitudinal data, it is possible that students experience transition of schools during the six academic years. So since the study included school level variables, the results related to those school level variables should be interpreted with caution. Third, the most recent data accessible for this study was through the 2013 to 2014 school year, and future studies should examine whether the trends and relationships found in this study have continued into the present or if they have changed in any way. Congratulations, you have completed the module about risk factors of out-of-school suspensions. Thank you.